So my beard is getting progressively longer as the quarantine continues and the barbershops are still closed. I could obviously cut it on my own, but I'm way too scared by now, it's too long. Anyhow, you probably know that your New Testament that you love and read every day, or at least once a week, that it quotes the Old Testament quite a few times. Those quotations are probably even marked in your Bible in some way. Anyhow, these quotations are going to be our topic today and something that's rather special about them. So the New Testament quotes the Old Testament a lot. The New Testament writers did not use any type of quotation marks, so there is no real authoritative answer to how many quotations there are, but the estimate is around 300 plus 500 more allusions plus 150 or so likely allusions, so that brings the total to almost 1,000, so that's a lot. I bet you know some of the most famous uh, quotations, but I don't know if you ever compared the New Testament text that is quoting the Old Testament with the actual Old Testament. And if you did so, you might have been surprised by the differences you saw in the text. So today we are going to look at those differences, how they happened, what is the reason for that, and so let's dig into this. So if you ever compared the New Testament text with the Old Testament text, you might have arrived to the conclusion that you must be looking at some sort of paraphrase, that the New Testament writer is actually paraphrasing the Old Testament. And that is actually not the case in most cases. Anyway, it happens, but it is pretty rare. So let's have a look at the main reason why there are differences in the New Testament text and in the Old Testament text. The main reason for the differences between the text in our Old Testament and the supposed quotation of it in the, in the New Testament is really quite simple. The New Testament writers had at their disposal a translation of Hebrew scripture into Greek, translation that was done a few centuries before the time of the New Testament, translation called Septuagint, uh, that was denoted frequently by letters LXX, uh, standing for the Roman number 70. Translation that was, during the time of uh, writing of the New Testament, very popular among Jews. And the New Testament writers used it a lot. It kind of makes sense. They were writing in Greek, so it was natural to quote scripture in Greek, while translated from Hebrew again when they had the Greek translation handy. Septuagint has quite a varying degree of affinity uh, to the Hebrew text of the scripture, be it the Masoretic texts or some other scrolls, such as Dead Sea Scrolls, that we actually find and have at our disposal. Sometimes it is quite literal, the translation seems to be quite literal of the Hebrew text that we have. Sometimes it's more interpretative, or we could even call it a paraphrase. It could be related to the fact that, according to the story, 70 Hebrew scholars translated it, and some of them approached it really differently than, than others. And so the fact that the New Testament writers quote from the Septuagint rather than from the actual Hebrew text is the reason for most of the differences. So let's dive into the weeds a bit now. There seem to be four distinct categories of Old Testament quotations in the New Testament. Those that agree with both Septuagint and the Hebrew text that we have at our disposal. Obviously, this is only possible in cases where Septuagint actually matches uh, the Hebrew text. Then the second category are those translations that agree with Septuagint, uh, but do not agree with the Hebrew text. Third category are translations that agree with the Hebrew text. Uh, but do not agree with Septuagint. And the last uh, group are translations that actually do not agree with either. So they do not agree with either uh, the Septuagint or the Hebrew text, but they are close enough to one of them or both that we can actually identify that it is a quotation. It can be um, introduced by some sort of a quotation formula. So we can tell it's a quotation, we can tell from where it's a quotation, but it still differs from both Septuagint and the Hebrew text. So looking at these four categories and at how many times they actually happen in the New Testament, we can see that the New Testament authors show clear preference for Septuagint. When there is a difference between Septuagint and the Hebrew text in the passage they are quoting, they are much more likely, they much more frequently use the Septuagint over the Hebrew text. 
So let's have a look at this first category that we said is the most frequent one, where the Septuagint differs from the Hebrew text and the quotation actually aligns with Septuagint. One famous difference is when the author of the Epistle to Hebrews in uh, Hebrews 10, 5-7 quotes from Psalm 46-8. And he says, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but the body you have prepared for me. This is really a famous quotation. This differs, actually. This quotation comes from Septuagint, and it differs from the Hebrew text that we find translated in our psalm. So if you ever look at Psalm 40 and read it, you will find sacrifices and offering you have not desired, but you have given me an open ear. In my experience, this is probably the most frequently cited example of this kind of a difference. It is also one when one wonders why such a substantial difference. Prepared body versus open ear. That's quite a difference. The typical explanation is that the Septuagint is interpreting the Hebrew here. While I would assume that most of us would understand the Hebrew open ear to speak about God opening our ears to be able to hear him, the typical explanation is that the translators understood it as referring to creation of Adam. That is, in the sense of digging or carving the ears from the mud, and hence they interpretatively translated it as preparation of body, as in the creation of the whole body by God. This uh, interpretative translation of the very different Hebrew text really nicely fits the purpose of the writer of Hebrews. The sacrifice of Christ wouldn't be possible without the body. The original Hebrew text referring to opening ears would make little sense here. Let's have a look at one more example. I really like this one. It's kind of funny in how interpretative it is. Hebrews 3.15 quotes Psalm 95 and it says, Today, when you hear his voice, do not harden your heart as in the rebellion. The original Hebrew text, if you actually read Psalm 95, you will, you will read, Oh, that today you would hearten to his voice. Harden not your heart as at Meribah. Notice the difference in the last word. It seems like the translator of Septuagint simply interpreted Meribah as rebellion. And indeed, Israel hardened their heart at Meribah and rebelled there against God. I think today's translation theory certainly wouldn't classify this kind of translation as literal. More a free one or perhaps paraphrase. We have already stated that the New Testament writers showed clear preference for Septuagint. So when there is a difference in the text between a Septuagint and the Hebrew text, they are much more likely to actually quote uh, from the Septuagint. But sometimes it is the other way around. Sometimes when, there are, when they are quoting from a text that differs between Septuagint and the Hebrew text, they actually quote from the Hebrew text. So this is the second category of cases that we mentioned at the beginning. So let's have a look at a couple examples. So let's start with an example that is fairly important because it is a messianic prophecy. When Matthew in 2.15 quotes Hosea's prophecy from Hosea 11.1, 1, he says... Out of Egypt have I called my son. And that is actually the Hebrew wording of this prophecy or of this verse. He is not using Septuagint, which would actually read, Out of Egypt have I called his children. Notice the plural versus singular difference. My son versus his children. The singular from the Hebrew text that uh, Matthew is actually using uh, much better fits the fulfillment in Jesus. Perhaps that is the reason uh, he is using it, because otherwise Matthew, just like most of the other New Testament authors, shows very strong preference for Septuagint, but not in this case. Another interesting example is John 1937, quoting from Zechariah 12.10. He says, They shall look upon him whom they have pierced which is the original Hebrew text, Hebrew wording, unlike the Septuagint, which says, they shall look upon me because they have mocked me. Again, the pierced variant uh, much better fits Jesus than the Septuagint mocked me. And again, John is in a majority of cases following Septuagint reading, but not in this case. 
Third category is the 10% or so uh, of the quotations that actually do not match either the Septuagint or uh, the Hebrew text. They differ from both. So the question is, where did these uh, quotations, where did these texts come from? Well, we don't really know. It could be that there was some manuscript variant, some kind of uh, wording of that particular text that is no longer preserved and the New Testament writers quoted from it that way. It could be that these are the cases where the New Testament writers did not feel the need to really follow either of these texts and sort of paraphrase them. We do not know. So let's have a look at a couple of these examples. Let's again start with an example from Matthew, this time from chapter 2, verse 6. Matthew here undoubtedly quotes Micah 5.2, and he says, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will govern my people Israel. The Septuagint, however, says, And though Bethlehem, house of Ephratah, art few in number to be reckoned among the thousands of Judah, Yet out of thee shall, uh, shall one come forth uh, to me to be a ruler of Israel. And then the Hebrew text sh uh, says, But you, O Bethlehem, uh, Ephratah, who are little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel. Notice that there are a number of differences here. Judah is Ephratah in both the Hebrew text and Septuagint. You can see the rest of the differences on the screen. There, there are really a lot of them, so I'm not going to go through them. So let's have a look at an example from Matthew from chapter 27. It is actually f frequently listed as an example of this type of quotation in the New Testament that doesn't match either uh, the Septuagint or uh, the Hebrew text, but I don't truly really agree with that. Let's have a look at the example first, however. Uh, so in Matthew 27, 9 to 10, we read following famous verses. And they took the 30 pieces of silver, the price of him on whom a price had been set by some of the sons of Israel, and they gave them for the potter's field, as the Lord directed me. Now, this is supposedly a quotation from Zechariah 11, 12 to 13, where in the Septuagint we would read, and they weighed uh, for my price thirty pieces of silver, and the Lord said to me, Drop them into the furnace, and I will see if it is good metal, as I was proved for their sakes. And I took the thirty pieces of silver and cast them into the furnace in the house of the Lord. Now the Hebrew text is quite a quite a bit different from uh, from the Septuagint, and it says, And they weighed uh, out as my wages thirty shekels of silver. Then the Lord said to me, cast, uh, cast into the treasury, the lordly price at which I was paid off by them. So I took the 30 pieces of silver and cast them into the treasury in the house of the Lord. So you can see that the differences are fundamental here. The actual uh, New Testament version pretty much does not match at all. Uh, either the Septuagint or the Hebrew text, and there are substantial differences between the Septuagint and the Hebrew text as well. I actually don't think uh, this is a quotation. This is, to me, more like an allusion, so I wouldn't really, uh, wouldn't really think about it as a quotation. The last category of quotations are the quotations where the Hebrew text matches the Septuagint text and the New Testament matches both of them. And good news, uh, this is actually a good chunk of the quotations. Around 75% of all the New Testament quotations of the Old Testament of the Hebrew Scripture actually matches both uh, the Septuagint and the Hebrew text. One thing to add into this discussion uh, as sort of a background information is the fact that the quotation marks, as we know them and use them, are actually pretty recent invention. They come from roughly 16th century. That said, certain way to mark quotations was actually much older. We can find them in, in much more ancient manuscripts. However, it seems like the New Testament writers did not use them. So, for their purpose or for our purpose of studying New Testament and its quotations of Old Testament, this doesn't really apply. They did not use any way to signify uh, the uh, quotations. So in conclusion, our New Testament builds on two main sources when quoting or alluding to the Old Testament. 
On one side, it is the Hebrew text that is pretty much the same, very likely pretty much the same as the Masoretic text, and hence very close to the Hebrew text that our Old Testament translation is based on. And second, it is the ancient translation of the Hebrew text into Greek uh, called Septuagint. Additionally, it is important to know and to understand that the norms and the ethics of quotations, that is really a recent invention. So back then, uh, during the times of writing of the New Testament, quoting someone by paraphrasing them was not really considered a big deal. That is a short explanation of the differences you can see in your Bible between the, the Old Testament text and the New Testament text that is supposedly quoting that uh, Old Testament text. So now you know. Hope that is useful and talk to you next time.